Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. In this one, I'm going to be reviewing The Mandalorian Season 3, Chapter 17, which is Episode 1 of this new season. I have to say, I thought the beginning was really interesting. I kind of expected it to be a short tag scene. It was like a Mandalorian version of a Catholic baptism, except then there's a huge sea monster that comes out of nowhere and it actually kills one of the Mandalorians. What I really liked about this scene was I kept expecting them to just kill it and the scene to end and then to all just look at each other and it to be like, da -dum, the, you know, the like Mandalorian theme. But it just kept going. I thought it was going to end and it just kept going. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. And then we even get to see Paz Vizsla. He is still with the armor. He saves this little kid. And then the Mandalorian comes in and saves all of the people. I also really liked about this scene, and it's really cool because it's like an action speaks louder than words moment. Seeing the Mandalorians all working together as such a cohesive unit, it just felt like such a strong fellowship. I just felt like it did a really good job at showing that the Armorers clan as a team, I really liked that vibe that that gave. Next we get a scene of the Mandalorian convincing the Armorer to approve his mission to Mandalore so that he can atone for his sins. I talked about this in my two trailer breakdowns for this show, and I'll link those at the end of this video, but I really just am not getting on board very well with the armorer as a character. She's just the leader of a cult. I, I can't help but agree with Bo-Katan. Like, I don't think Bo-Katan is the right ruler for Mandalore, but in season two, Bo-Katan explains to the Mandalorian that it's literally only his cult that doesn't remove their helmets. And so I guess I just don't understand how the Mandalorian has has now even obtained the dark saber and he's still bowing down to what the armorer says i don't get it and i'm kind of jumping around here but in the end of the episode we get to see the kree's estate which proves my theory from the first trailer we got for the show right that that's what that castle was but we get even another scene with bo katan where she talks about the fleet she assembled in the end of season two's finale and all of her people she gathered split and parted ways and are working as mercenaries since she didn't come back with the Darksaber. And so I, I just can't help but think, I know, I know we are on the path to the Mandalorian becoming the leader of Mandalore ultimately. I, I understand and like that as an end goal, but I don't understand how we are still on Mando seeing, seeing, he's seen the examples of the other Mandalorians that don't just wear their helmets religiously. I don't get why he's defaulting back to that old way. And he's even teaching Grogu in the cockpit of his N1 Starfighter about the Mandalorian ways, and it's not just about combat. But that makes me question it even more. If he already has the Darksaber, why is he acting like... Like, why is he still just following that one cult he's in, or was in with the armor's rules so i mean it i'm just saying it makes sense that he is still adamant about wearing the helmet but also it's pissing me off i just have to be honest about that i also really enjoyed the navarro scenes i talked about this in my guardians of the Vo i talked about this in my guardians of the galaxy volume 3 trailer video i did a couple days ago it's not even the main point of the trailer but i just love so much the guardians have nowhere as their home now and so just one of the coolest things about this first episode of season three is seeing Navarro super chilled out and super peaceful under Grand Magistrate Karga. So it was really cool seeing Navarro. I also loved the pirate encounter with Vane and his men. I thought that was really cool. And I didn't think that they were going to show the pirate king at at like kind of towards the end of the episode that was awesome also y'all they straight up full front talked about the gina carano situation i don't think firing gina carano was the best decision after carrie Fisher's what after carrie fisher's passing i think gina carano you know obviously there's more male figures in star wars that's not really something that can be debated and they had her as like their best female character for little girls to look up to and they fired her. I just thought that was such an such a like odd choice. But I did appreciate that they right out of the gate addressed it. And honestly, the way they addressed it makes sense, which again is why I really love John Favreau. 
as the showrunner for this, I've seen so many interviews where you see how deeply he cares. And he did a great job of, of paying off the scene towards the end of season two, where the New Republic pilot gives her the New Republic officer badge, basically, and, and offers her the job and understands and is sentimental of her losing everyone when Tarkin destroyed the Death Star. What am I? What am, what am I on, y'all? I'm sorry. It's 3.40 in the morning when Tarkin destroys Alderaan. So even though I think the firing of their biggest female lead was very, very odd, I do think the explanation for where Cara Dune is during season three was a really good decision and it just like a very makes sense choice i have to say though y'all i i want to be careful because i know that a lot of or i feel like i love star wars so much that sometimes i'm more merciful on it than other franchises so i feel like i do have to talk about some l's in this episode a little bit one l which i understand is just because of where the story's at is din's hard on about wearing his helmet i understand that that's just where he is at mentally so that's not too big of an L. But the biggest L for me in this episode was honestly the stuff about IG-11. Now when I say that, please don't stab me. I just mean IG-11 was one of those characters where he was great in season one. And when he dies, it's a real like, oh no, come on moment. And I feel like it takes away from his death to have him come back but also i just felt like they wasted time in this episode with that plot and it just felt odd to me because i'm just imagining like if if when season seven of the clone wars came out we knew we were going to get 12 episodes a lot of fans i, I would say 95 percent of fans would say that four of those episodes were wasted but i just felt like that ig11 stuff was like if we got a new Clone Wars episode in season seven and the announcer voice guy at the beginning comes on and he's like, rumors are that if the Republic goes back to the Citadel, they could possibly find Evan PL's bones. So in this episode, five ARC troopers will return to the Citadel and search for Evan PL's arm. I was just like, what? Why? Like, why? Really? Why? Why do I... Why? Like, IG-11 was great. Why are we spending time, like... What? And again, y'all, if, if, if I'm making you mad, I guess that sucks for you. I just figured that I should be fair and not just completely nice because it's Star Wars. I, I, I think IG-11's story was complete in Season 1. And maybe he's going to have some badass scene that makes me look bad now. Like later on in the season, but I, I just thought that was kind of odd. Y'all, I have to say the high light of this episode was the space scenes. I, I, I cannot describe to y'all how cool this was. When Mando and Grogu go into hyperspace for the first time in this episode after leaving the Mandalorian baptism in the very beginning, we get to see Grogu looking out into hyperspace and there's a pack of pergil flying in hyperspeed alongside mando's starfighter i literally got chills y'all and so often i will see this is probably not a good thing because i know creators should be supporting creators but i'll just see takes online where people are like oh my god the way mando steps with one foot and then the next, next foot and then left again and then right again stepping with each foot one at a time before the other it's so hot and i'm like dude dude he's walking are you serious ladies and gentlemen i actually dead ass not not just like simping over the mandalorian taking four steps in a row and that being badass you know like that i see takes like that that i think are kind of weird i literally got goosebumps from this scene y'all the last time we saw pergil in star wars was in the grand finale of the Star Wars Rebels show. And I have a feeling this is teasing the Ahsoka show in a way. Because the way that Ezra Bridger and Grand Admiral Thrawn disappear, Ezra beats him by communing with the Force with the Pergil. And the Pergil attach themselves to Thrawn's ship and launch Ezra, Thrawn themselves, and Thrawn's ship into hyperspace and they aren't seen for the rest of the galactic civil war so i really do think that that john favreau maybe even dave filoni included this 
awesome scene with live action Pergil to kind of tease Ezra's return. I think Ezra's going to return in the Ahsoka show, y'all. I think this was a tease for that. Maybe after Ahsoka leaves Luke during the events of the Book of Boba Fett and continues her journey looking for Ezra, she might try to follow the Pergil. Who knows? But that scene I just thought was amazing. And then the battle 1v6 in space against Vayne and his pirates that Mando has. <laughs> oh, man. I love that. It was even so much better than the season one space battle that Mando had with that bounty hunter that was trying to catch Grogu. I just thought this was spectacular. And then also, they didn't even use Vane as a completely stupid pirate. They even had Vane. I, I like this. Of course, Vane is not as badass or smart as Din Djarin, but he did at least have the brain power to lead him back to the pirate king. And the Pirate King's design was hella unique. I thought that was really, really cool. And I like that Manda was able to escape too, of course. So overall, y'all, I think it was a solid start to the season. I think it was a little slower compared to the beginnings of season one and season two. Of course, since season one started this whole Mandoverse thing. And season two's beginning was, I think, the longest Mando episode to date at about 52 minutes. So I think this was the slowest start to a season we've had. But the whole point is to plant seeds. And it did a really good job of that. The only things I had problem with was the the time focused on IG-11. It felt like, like if we had gotten a Clone Wars episode wasted to go find Evan Piel's arm on the Citadel in season seven. I, it just felt unnecessary. Again, I've said that I trust John Favreau, so I'm hoping that he proves me wrong, of course. And then, yeah, y'all, the, the Pergil scene in hyperspace, the space battle, and honestly, the pirate encounter on Navarro in the streets by the school, I think were my favorite parts of this episode. I don't want to, I don't want to turn y'all away by my rating, but I don't want to rate it too high because I don't, want when there's episodes that blow it out of the park even harder for me to only be able to go up 1.5 points so i want to give this episode an 8 out of 10 it was a very solid episode i loved some of the character moments it gave us in this i'm really shaking my head annoyed at the armor's character and at din for caring so much about having his helmet on i don't understand the hard on for that but again he was raised in the cult so i get that it makes sense also love the pergil so much y'all i i loved that scene if you guys are interested in more quick thought review videos right after seeing the episodes make sure to drop a like i'll have my two links for my trailer reactions i did for the mandalorian on display at the end if you want to check those out and sub to the channel y'all if y'all think this will be the best season of the mandalorian yet peace